Hello, everyone. Welcome to Speak Brave Podcast. Have you ever experienced such frustration, perhaps failure, so maybe such miscommunication in your most important relationships in life? At home, with your siblings, maybe parents, or at work, or in a community, and you did everything right that you thought you did, and still there was frustration, maybe miscommunication, and probably worst of all, missed opportunities. And if you ever experienced that, I have a special guest, an expert in relationships who have served in executive and managerial uh, positions in the last three decades. It is my good friend, Barbara Amato. Hello. How are you, Mark? I'm good. Thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing this time with us. Thank you for having me. Barbara, could you just please tell us who you are and what do you have going on in your world? Who am I? Wow, that's a big one. Like, who am I is so big. I am a wife, a mother, a grandmother. That's the first. That's the most important. That's the overall arching. I have a wonderful husband of 45 years. I have two children, two grandchildren. I have a wonderful work family. I have been a training manager, uh, president of my own company. I am a guest experience manager at a Fortune 50 company. I'm a speaker and a storyteller and just a lover of people. I love people and anything I can do to touch people is what I do. Mm. And I would like to share with listeners and people who are watching us. I met Barbara about five years ago and we both are, have a very strong common interest in Toastmasters International. We're both active members and Barbara is a leader in our organization. And she is one of those people that has a compassion and care for the development of others. So, Barbara, I'd like to ask you this. What do you think is the challenge for the new leaders who are good at what they do? Uh, Not just good, they're excellent. And now they are being thrust or tasked with leading teams. What kind of mistakes they should be looking out not to make and what kind of mindset they should enter to lead with with effectiveness? I think that the biggest challenge that any leader has is having the strength of personality to, to lead, but also knowing how and when to leave the ego at the door because it's about the people. Everything we do in life is about the people, whether it's your work or your personal life. Consider a working situation. You have a product or a service that you offer, and you have people that help you contribute to delivering that product. You have people on the other end that are receiving that product, and um, hundreds of people in between and you're affecting them all. Often I hear people say, I don't need to learn how to speak, or I don't need these things because I'm an individual contributor, I'm an accountant, but even accountant has peers and has leaders. And in the end, you have customers too. So understanding that it's about all the people and the product or service is a tool that you use to benefit people. They have jobs, they have products they need. That product is the tool. The people are what makes a difference. So leave your ego at the door and then step back. And to truly lead, you need to constantly be looking at yourself and and be introspective and ask yourself questions about the people and how you're leading and things like your integrity where that's where it starts to me barbara what does integrity mean to you 
I think that integrity is the bottom line. I believe in values. I believe every company should have core values. I believe every relationship has core values, whether you know it or not, they're there. And understanding and considering and preparing those values are what makes the difference in how you treat the people. And it starts with integrity because integrity means that you are acting with the best of intentions and you're open and aware and learning all at the same time. Integrity is more important than honesty because you can be honest and cruel. You can say something that's honest and lose compassion and hurt someone. There are so many other values, but to me, integrity is the starting place and the focal place. Because if you learn to live with integrity, then you'll build your other values around that and you'll build your relationships with people in a way that they will trust you and you will be able to be honest and have the other values as you go. What would be, um, is there a story or perhaps an example that you can help us understand and make sure that this message resonates? When I think about a story where integrity is important, there's so many, there's so many, and it's such a challenging thing to think of one specific issue. But I have been in the position at work where I've been given a task that is, it's, it's fair. I may not believe in it. I may not 100% agree to it, but at the same time, I'm being paid to do a job. And unless it's illegal or immoral or unethical, when they tell me to do something, I have to do it. So my integrity comes into play when I sit down and say, is this illegal, immoral, unethical? If it fits those, why is this important to the company? Maybe I don't understand the bottom line. Maybe it's way above my pay grade, something that I'm not privy to for many reasons, but I still need to execute it. So at that point, I have to draw on my personal integrity to work with my employees and my coworkers, as well as manage up to my management and provide the service and the function that they've asked me to do because it is required and I do collect a paycheck as agreed with my company, but to do it in such a way that it works within my bounds of integrity. And that is to get it done, but to be fair to all my people as I move along. When I can, if I, if I know, then I will inform the people that I work with of what we're doing, why we're doing it. And if it's not, then I'll just tell them honestly, I don't know. This is something that I'm not privy to, but there's no reason for us not to do it. So that's a, that is a real specific situation that happens in work all the time when you have to determine how you're going to do something that you just don't understand or agree with. But your integrity says, I collect the check. We have an agreement. They're going to pay me. I'm going to do what I have to do. Just because I don't understand it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Mm. Very interesting. This is the good stuff, Barbara. This is the good stuff. I love it. I like to ask questions that challenge the thinking, that mm -hmm. go deeper and try not just to be a surface questions or answers, uh, but just go a little bit deeper because people appreciate, and we talked about this in the pre-interview about your vulnerability as a leader. Um, could you talk about some of the qualities that you have collected um when i mean collected you paid attention to it outside of integrity that every leader must cultivate and also if they don't what happens then i think that leaders need we all need to be organized we need to to do the job we need to do all the managerial work so there's managerial work and there's leader work I think we need to understand the difference, first of all, between being a manager and a leader and what work is managerial work and what work is leadership work. If you really want to be a true leader, you have to learn to look outside of yourself 
and learn what makes everyone tick. And that's your boss and your clients. You have to be a study of people. You have to be a study of society too. You need to understand how those people must work within society. As a leader, I often will have a employee who has a critical emergency. They have something that's going on. I need to be able to have the compassion to understand that. I need to be able to relate to them. And often I use storytelling and that's where I will allow myself to become vulnerable. I'll talk about when I made the same mistake they did or when I suffered the same kind of suffering or something else, when I have been through that. So you need to be vulnerable, you need to be compassionate, and you need to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're working with. Many years ago, I stepped into a leadership role for the first time and I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I learned by watching other leaders I remember when I left that job, one of my employees gave me a, a necklace with an, my initial and an angel on it. And they said that was because I was their angel and I was their boss. And, and I didn't understand then what I had done. But as the years have gone by and I look at, I understand. I remember when that person had an accident. I remember when that person had a, a personal relationship failure. And I did everything I could to talk to them and help them through it. One of the things I always tell the people that work with me is when you're going through a, a, a tragedy or a, a challenging time, you need to make sure that if it's at home, that we can nurture each other at work. Or if you're having a challenge at work, make sure your home environment can nurture you because no one can be perfect all the time and you don't want everything falling apart, home, work, family, everything. So understanding people and opening yourself up and sharing your experiences of when you had a difficult time. There's, uh, I told you I'm married 45 years. I have had 44 happy years. We had one nasty year. I was working midnight shifts and my husband was doing days and we were trying to start a small business. We had two teenagers and I was exhausted all the time. And I felt like I would come home and sleep while my family had all the good time. They got to go and do all the fun family stuff and, and I slept or worked. And I felt estranged. Now it was me, it wasn't them, it was all me. But I let it affect my work too. I called in sick, I went home early, I was distracted, and it made the challenge to be home and work instead of having at least one safe place. And I know that I was emotionally distraught and I needed somewhere to go. And I was fortunate. I had a wonderful Christian woman who worked with me, who held my hand. And every time I made a complaint, she said something positive. And if I said, this is wrong with this, and she'd say, what's good about it? Or I'm mad at my husband, tell me, how did you meet him? So every time I was in a negative, she turned it to a positive. And that's a wonderful leadership trait. If we can do that when we're feeling things are crazy and we can find a way to turn it to a positive. Mm. Wow, so much good information here, Barbara. And also honest. I feel goosebumps just listening to you about this depth of uh, vulnerability. Um, since we're talking about relationships, um, what kind of things can you share for people who maybe are having difficult times and, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not laughing at this, but I'm just laughing because it's true for so many. And also people suffer in silence. Yes, they do. They do. People think that a challenge in a relationship is a failure. And it's not. It's, it's a bridge. It's a time in your life where you're going to go down one path or another. And no one can tell you what 
the best path is, whether or not you need to end the relationship and move on, or whether or not you need to continue where you're going. But I'm going to tell you that in my case, I'm glad I continued. I actually said to my husband, I think that maybe we should divorce. And he said, no, I married you for life. So you're stuck with me. And I am so blessed because I didn't even mean it when I said it. I just didn't know where else to go because I was hurting and I didn't know what to say. It's, it's like a roller coaster. You, you go up and you're climbing and you're climbing. And it's so exciting when you're waiting to get on the roller coaster. And it's so enthusiastic and you're going up and you're going up and you see that everything is right beyond you. And just before you go through the thrill of all the good stuff, you say, wait, I'm getting off. I, I can't deal with this. Because in relationships, the good stuff only happens, at, and it's really in anything, right? You don't really know joy until you feel pain. Tom and I actually had four. I told you I had two children. We had four. Two of our children died before they were a year old. When our fourth child died, David, I don't think Tom and I got through that as well as we should have. We had two other children. We had jobs. Jenny had passed. She was our first. And... We didn't know how to take care of each other or ourselves. And that's when that bad year came, it, when we started dealing with it, whether we realized it or not. And when I think about that, that was the bump in the roller coaster that I, I couldn't change it. People say, oh my God, you were so brave. I wasn't brave. I had no choice. Nobody asked me. But we went over the roller coaster and we had the rough time. And then we held on to each other and then we went downhill. I was telling my girlfriend this morning, this is the best time of my life. If I had quit when it was rough, I wouldn't have the best husband in the world. That goes for your relationships at work. That goes for your relationships in your family. You know, we all can look at our parents and say, you know, if you had done this different, I know my children can say that to me. I know I can look at my mother and say, well, you know, but I have chosen to focus on the good traits of my mothers and my father. I've had times where I didn't. I've chosen to look at the good things about my husband. And when I'm at work and I'm working with my employees and my coworkers, oh yeah, they're family. And I have bad days and I'll say, oh, that person just really irritated the heck out of me. And sometimes it might go on too long. And then if it does, I hope somebody is a good enough friend to say, Barb, you need to chill. Because sometimes I do need to chill. But you got to go over the top. And, and I read a book once it called The Bumps Are What You Climb On. And if you're going to reach the tower, you got to climb. Hmm. What is the name of the book? And I'll put it in the show notes as well. The Bumps Are What You Climb On. That's the name of it. It's, I don't remember who it was, but it's the story of Joseph. The bumps is what you climb on. Mm -hmm. mm. Such a beautiful story. And I'm sorry to hear all the tribulations you went through. And thank you for sharing. Um, Barbara, what would you describe as your biggest failure? My biggest failure. That's a really big challenging thing. I had a small business that failed. And there's a lot of reasons it failed. But in the end, it failed because we were so distracted, we didn't give enough attention to detail. And that was a big failure. Uh, that failure caused, okay, so now you're going to really get it. That failure caused us to go through bankruptcy. We lost everything. We lost every single thing we had. 401k was sunk into it. It was the senior year of my son in high school. I couldn't give him the things that I wanted to because we had worked so hard. And I think my lesson from that is not to stop. I would do another business in a heartbeat, but I would not pass off the responsibilities of the little things. I would keep myself aware because when accounting issues came up, I had no idea that they were bad. 
I was too busy. I was actually working that midnight shift job running this business. That's my biggest failure. And probably the reason that that's my biggest failure isn't even the financial, but it was the burden that it put on my high school kids and our family and things like that. But my husband and I worked hard together. When it was time to end that business though, it just opened another part of our life. Mm. We, we, I signed up all of my clients for another year, gave my business with a balance of zero, no profit, no negative to one of my employees. And we packed up and we moved to Florida with no job and only $3,000 to our name and started over. And we love it. We're successful. We're happy. We have a home. We have a savings. We have a 401k. We have good jobs. So my biggest failure led me to where I'm at now. If I hadn't taken that risk, then maybe I wouldn't be here today. Wow. This is good. <laughs> This is good information for anyone who it also gives hope no matter where you are in life. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing is, is to hold that hope in you and to strive for peace because you, you need to have peace in your soul, but sometimes you don't have it. And sometimes you go years and years and years wondering when the next day of peace is going to be. And whether that's because you can't pay your bills because you're out of work because of COVID or whether it's because you're going through a personal tragedy or whether it's because your marriage is struggling or relationship with your kids, but the hope is there and you've got to find it and you can't let anger drive you. You can't let the pain drive you. You've got to look beyond that and find what it is you're looking for and what it is you want and what it is that's going to bring you to the other side. And then you got to focus on that and feed that joyful premonition or that hope or that desire instead of feeding the pain or the anger because we can all do that and that's the easy way and that's the instinctive way but no matter what you go through if you put hope there and you never stop striving for it it may be 10 years you may go through years i mean we took years and years and years to recover financially but we worked at it and we didn't give up and we didn't let it ruin our marriage and we didn't let it ruin our kids. Mm. So hope. Yeah. I love this. Um, Barbara, what is next for you? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. That's what's so wonderful and so exciting. I have no idea. I'm furloughed due to COVID. I don't have work. I don't know when the money's going to come in or is not going to come in. I'm blessed though. I can retire if I want to. I don't want to yet. I hope to do a few more years. But if not, I'm working on a few things. I'm working on writing. I'm, I wrote a few short stories. They're published. I'm hoping that I can write more. My working title in my brain that I'm starting on is um, The Reflections of an Ordinary Woman. Because I'm just that. I'm nothing more than anyone else. I'm not some spectacular person, but my favorite, favorite quote of all is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson, And he says, success is to know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. And I want to positively affect people one at a time. I may not ever reach the masses. I'm not, I'm not Tony Robbins or Les Brown or Oprah Winfrey, but if I can help one person who is struggling with the death of a family member, if I can comfort one person who doesn't know where to go with their marriage, if I can take one employee that works for me who's going through a challenging time and make their life a little bit easier at work while they're dealing with that, then that's what my life is about. And that means I'm just an ordinary woman, but I want 
to help people one at a time. And that's my story that I'm working on. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get it, but I'm working on it because every ordinary person out there has the ability to be great, even if it's only to one person at a time. That is well said and uh, very insightful, beautiful sentiment. If we can, because this is a, in our choice, it's in our power yep. uh, to, to affect and help others, um, not for accolades, but because it's a part of our identity. Yes. This is part of our building blocks. I hope that's what people really feel. And uh, like you said, there has been some bumps. Yep. And we are in the big one right now, collectively as humanity. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's going to be an interesting uh, thing. So I would like to, we're coming to the end of this, um, of this interview. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing your uh, part of your story and being so vulnerable and open. So what is your hope for people coming out of the health crisis? My hope is that we will all come together without judgment. The health crisis and the politics of today have put friends at odds and families. And we need to step back and reflect on and ask ourselves, am I being a part of that problem? In other words, if we're talking about politics, people are going to say, oh, well, my side is right and your side is wrong. And if we're doing that, then we're part of that problem. We need to listen carefully and openly to what the other side's saying. Doesn't mean you have to agree or disagree. Doesn't matter which side you're on. But we've got to stop drawing lines in the sand and telling people to cross them. We need to start saying, let's meet in the middle. Let's meet as people. Let's let our shared concerns and problems and, and joys be what define our relationships, not do you agree with this side or that side? Mm -hmm. And we're in a position now where we all can get our 15 minutes of fame on Facebook, on a blog, on a podcast. So I ask you, we're going through this right now, and what do you want to be remembered by? The strife that you caused or the hope that you brought into somebody's life? The challenge that you gave someone in not a positive way or the integrity that you stand up with? Do you want to lead the world to peace and love through your behaviors? That's what I want to do. And uh, we will make sure to post this and I will be uh, sharing this episode with everyone who have stayed with me for many years and yet new listeners as well. Barbara, what is the best? This is my final question. <laughs> what is the best way for future fans, followers, and allies to connect with you? Right now, honestly, the best way to connect me is, is just through my email account or my Facebook, and they're both Barbara Amato. It's Barbara Amato 2 at Gmail. My Facebook is Barbara Amato. And I'm working on a blog, and I'm new at it, so I'm not 100% there, but BarbaraAmato.com is where my simple little blog with only four or five entries are, but I'm working on that, BarbaraAmato.com. Excellent. And I'll be making sure that I put this in a published episode uh, show notes so everyone who is interested to work with you or contact you or hear you again will be able to find you in an easy uh, way. 
Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I'm truly honored. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who enjoyed this episode and learned something, perhaps reflected. There's a lot of gems and a lot of uh, uh, beautiful discussion points. And I hope you can revisit this episode over and over again and add it to your favorites and to your collection as well. Remember, there's people right now who have less experience than you, who have less qualifications than you have, and yet they live in the life that you can only dream of. The difference, they made a decision and took imperfect action. So I invite you to make a decision and, make, and take imperfect action in your life right now or as soon as you can. Thank you, everyone, for giving us your time, your, your attention. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this podcast with everyone you care about. Thank you, everyone, and don't forget to speak brave.